All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining uh, the last part of our TC 105 Geomechanics from Micro to Macro Seminar Series on Discrete Element Method in Geotechnical Engineering Education. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, it's a good time in the US right now, morning. Uh, I know it's late afternoon for some of you or really nighttime for uh, some of you. So, so thank you very much for joining. This particular uh, lecture will be recorded as similar to the other ones and will be, it'll be available for, uh, they will be available through YouTube link. Um, I, I just want to introduce uh, our, today's lecture, uh, Professor Krishna Kumar. Uh, Krishna did his PhD at University of Cambridge uh, in 2015, and then he, he was a postdoc for a while and then moved to University of Texas, Austin. He's currently assistant professor over there. His uh, interests are in, in the area of multi-scale molding of natural hazards, landslide, earthquake, debris flow. Uh, he's been working on material point method and discrete element method, which you'll see many things today. Uh, he is really into high performance computing, geomechanics, and more interested in, and also getting more interested in machine learning and all these things. So uh, I'll, uh, I hope you enjoy this particular lecture. Um, Krishna, uh, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Professor Soga. Uh, it's really uh, honored to be here. And I've seen all the videos, the recordings, and it's been exceptional. Hopefully, um, I can try to show what's possible. So with this idea of building a real-time interactive uh, playground. Um, I'm going to talk about three uh, different aspects of building a real-time playground. So this is a look into the future. Uh, we are building or we have some of these components um, and trying to be, uh, finalize these real-time playgrounds. So it's a work in progress, but we have these individual components of it, which you can um, see right now or use them right now. I'll post those links um, here on those slides. Um, so what we mean by real-time playground, there has been several research, several people have worked, like uh, I know Professor Arduino had a virtual lab, and I saw um, Benji Marks uh, gave a presentation on his virtual labs of using DEM. Um, you've seen so many virtual lab components, and I'm trying to uh, do a real-time virtual lab component at a much bigger or realistic uh, scale. If we are talking about like a big natural slope um, or millions of particles which you can interact with live in real time. And that's the goal. And that's where I think where we want to go towards the future in terms of how we can improve the knowledge of discrete element and also continue modeling and in general, how granular materials behave. So we're going to talk about three different components. Uh, one is the real-time rendering. Uh, we're going to particularly talk about a technique called in-situ visualization, which we've been developing uh, here at UT in collaboration with the Texas Advanced Computing Center. Uh, the second part is machine learning. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in generalizable machine learning systems where you can allow you to simulate it and make some simulations faster and be able to explain what those simulations mean. I think that gives you an extra level of understanding of not just using a black box machine learning model, but also taking it further and be able to explain why that made that decision and is that uh, looking correct in terms of the physics of the behavior. And finally, um, the extended reality part is the slightly less developed section of this work. Um, and we are currently uh, working with Google uh, Summer of Code students to build up these tools. So hopefully by end of summer, um, we'll have a nice product um, in this area as well. So I'll go touch upon these three different topics. I'll so start off with doing the rendering or visualization. And keep in mind, these are trying to do really large scale visualization and uh, simulation so people can interact with this in real, in real time. Um, so we'll start with what is ray tracing. Um, so that's the very comical slide of what ray tracing is. It's from like you've all we've all been through the Marvel Cinematic Universe and Thanos. Um, so ray tracing is the idea of making realistic looking images by tracing the path of your lights 
look at how it bounces off different objects, uh, uh, capture the transparency and the interactions between lights uh, and multiple objects. So a really crude but funny representation of ray tracing is this, where you have a 2D image and a much more realistic looking 3D images. But in reality, this is how uh, ray tracing will look like, where uh, it is widely used in games. Um, so if you've been using PlayStation, Xbox, uh, lately they all uh, have ray tracing engines, basically a graphical processing unit, which renders realistic looking uh, systems. So if you look at the figure on the right-hand side where it says RTX off, which is where the ray tracing is switched off, um, particularly pay attention to the fire and the reflections on the water. You can see that the realism which you see in the left-hand side where you have ray tracing on, it's much more reflective and much more realistic in terms of how fire or uh, water is captured. Um, the idea behind this time um, when you're trying to convey to people what is important and if you're showing um, the recent animation movies like what Disney does with using material point method in movies like Frozen, they look very realistic. Um, and we want to be able to give a realistic platform for our students to try out their discrete element models or material point method so that it is much more intuitive and feels natural rather than, oh, that's a simulation. I don't trust the behavior, but we want to make it realistic so you can also see more interesting aspects to it. So ray tracing has been widely used. Like I said, this is a scene from Disney's Moana. Um, and here they're rendering 700,000 uh, triangles, so tessellations. Uh, and this particular scene, which is uh, right in front of the ocean, um, allows you to model different objects and the reflections and the interactions between different objects. Our simulations may not have as many different types of objects, but we can also think of discrete element method where you have different shaped particles. Um, and if you want to render that and make them look realistic, then you would want to bring in a technique like ray tracing into building a real-time simulation or virtual playground. Um, like I said, this simulation has about 700,000 triangles and they're looking at reflections off of these 700,000 triangles. But some of the simulations we would want to do, which looks more at the realistic scale, might be in several millions or like Professor Kenichi Soga always says, a billion particle simulation is our dream. Um, because that then gets us closer to a more realistic scale of what we want to see. So with this idea, we'll go into, that's all great if you're looking at a movie and you watch Disney or Pixar and you feel like, oh, these movies look great. But once you come back to our research environment or teaching environment, we don't think about the same effect of how realistic our rendering should be uh, so that it helps people learn. So the main question here is why do we need ray tracing in a scientific visualization, either in terms of research or in terms of teaching, why ray tracing is actually important. Um, so there, here's a, an example to convince you, hopefully to say ray tracing does actually help um, because you see two different figures of the earth crust uh, mantled, um, modeled uh, by the Kronos Group, which is uh, who oversees the PowerView development, which is an open source tool for visualization. And you can see the figure on the left where you don't have uh, ray tracing and the figure on the right hand side where you have ray tracing. Um, once you start bouncing off lights of these objects, you can start to see the depth effect. And it also gives you a very good understanding of like those different layers and how they interact. and allows you to extract very useful information which might not be available um, if you don't do ray tracing. So not just realistic looking images, but it also has a scientific um, value because it allows us to find out information which are otherwise inaccessible. So we've been using ray tracing for a um, while, uh, especially using Paraview. So if you use the open source uh, tool Paraview, recently Intel released a tool called Osprey, 
uh, that allows you to do ray tracing even on local CPU machines. So Osprey um, is the first one that brings ray tracing to a more CPU side, um, whereas typically ray tracing has been on graphical processing units or GPUs. Um, so here we are looking at like concrete flow examples with and without ray tracing. You obviously uh, see um, our teaching examples are almost always like these where I'll look at how the flow is because we are interested in how much the runout is or what the stresses are. Um, and not, we were not never interested in making things look much more realistic. And once you make it more realistic, I think there is always uh, more interactions from the students and also excitement from the students to understand what is happening. Um, so here's an example of with and without ray tracing and also what uh, ray tracing can allow you to do in terms of identifying uh, different layers in your system. Uh, so similar to the earth frost example from Kronos, we have used with and without ray tracing. You can see that, especially in these regions where you can't distinguish different regions of concrete flow, we are able to model that and visualize it in a much more realistic and intuitive way. So this has been great. So you, um, or hopefully this convinces you that we need to make um, better looking rendering. If not, we have some amazing videos from uh, people around the world who've done used ray tracing in conveying scientifically um, important simulations. So this is one by um, Dr. Suzuki uh, in Japan, where they did a lot of um, millions to billions of particle simulations. Um, and you can see how uh, the individual grains interact with different objects. And they still uh, like the golf ball um, a shot. And hopefully, we'll all get better looking at those simulations. And that was for discrete element. The method I'm showing here uh, is not restricted to discrete element methods. You can apply it to MPM or other continuum objects. It's a very generic method. And all the topics I'm going to cover today is much more generic in terms of it's not restricted to DEM. You can use the same visualization machine learning algorithms I will be showing uh, to do both DEM and MPM type simulations. Um, and here you have a two phase system from DreamWorks where you can model both the solid phase and the water uh, and see how a, a seepage induced failure can look like uh, to us or a more interesting dam failure if you're making an animation movie. So these are really expensive operations to do and we want to be able to do these in uh, real time. So we have certain challenges of making these visualization. These visualization typically requires a big supercomputer or lots of GPUs. And our visualization has always been sequential. That is, we will specify an input boundary condition, uh, set up the material properties, run the simulation, and then write down the results. But once you make the scale much, much bigger into millions of particles or even billions of particles, and you want to build a, a real-time playground, then you don't want to move an object and wait for five minutes before it reloads uh, the whole scene so that people can interact with it. So most of the real-time playgrounds have been restricted to a few thousand, maybe hundreds of thousands of particles. But uh, the goal for our work here at UT and PAC is to make these uh, real-time playgrounds much more accessible um, at large-scale uh, systems. So we're talking millions and billions of particles, which means when you're trying to write down this data, you're also trying to write down terabytes of data. Uh, and typically, all our simulations write down these huge amounts of data at a discrete finite time steps, typically every 100 or 1,000 steps, and we won't be able to see what's happening at individual uh, frequency, which means we'll see lags or jumps in our simulations or in our virtual playground, which is not very useful, especially if you want to be interactive and the students want to see what is happening live. Uh, so with this end goal and the idea that the ray tracing is really nice, there is a big challenge in how do you take this nice looking visualization make it real time and be able to simulate a, all of this um, in real time for large scale systems. So we have a particularly challenging task ahead. Um, and the goal is to go from the top row where you have your simulation code, write it out to an output system like Paraview and then do a rendering to have a more integrated approach where you will have um, your simulation and the visualization running in real time. 
And this particular technique is called as in-situ visualization. And my group here at UT and TAC are interested in developing this in-situ visualization technique as a way to do large scale systems and building uh, interactive playgrounds. So in-situ visualization is the idea that the simulation and visualization happen at the same time. Uh, so your simulation might be running on a certain number of cores on a supercomputer and your visualization will be using another set of cores uh, to run the rendering and they both communicate over memory so there is no actual writing of files but instead a more seamless uh movie so it's like disney or pixar is making their movie live and creating those animation and you can watch it at the same time that's the goal and we are also trying to do this in the scale of several millions to close to a billion particle range so for large deformation modeling, um, the example I'm going to show um, is using material points, but the material points are going to be rendered as spheres, so they are very similar to discrete element models, um, and not in terms of the actual physics behind it, but in terms of the visualization behind it, you can still render that as particles. Um, but if you have um, other differently uh, shaped particles, like if you're using the pseudo DEM code, um, then you can render those particles as individual shapes and allow you to do this in uh, in a re more real scale environment. So I'm going to show an example for rendering a 20 million uh, simulation runout in real time, where the simulation is not real time, the rendering isn't real time, and I'll talk about how to make the simulations faster so we can catch up with the rendering. So the problem with doing a large scale simulation and a large scale playground is you need a supercomputer uh, typically because you're going into the realms of several millions of particles either you need to run them on graphical processing units which are really great um, having thousands of cores easily accessible or you need to do a domain decomposed uh, a high performance computing simulation and make that uh, into a realistic environment um, so this is a um, an extension of the CBGO MPM code, which developed with Professor Kenichi Soga at um, Berkeley and started off in Cambridge, um, where we are showing like the domain decomposed MPM code is being able to scale almost linearly to tens of thousands of cores, and we've gone up to 15,000 co um, cores for linear scaling. So this allows us to go extremely large scale um, and simulate 20 to 500 million particles very easily in a much more reasonable uh, time scale. The problem is now um, your rendering is split into multiple systems. So instead of visualizing your system like you see here, uh, the black grids are running on a single node, the red ones are running on a different ones, the green and blue are on its own node, which means doing a ray tracing becomes much more difficult. Ray tracing is easy because you're, if they are running on a single node, you're looking at how the light bounces off of one of the particles and gets reflected around. But now if a light gets um, hit on these black particles, you don't know what its interaction will be with the red and blue particles, which are running on completely different systems. And typically what we do is write down these files into individual nodes and then pull it back together at a much later time. But if you're doing this in real time, you don't really have that option and you have to render the whole thing um, at the same time and uh, run it so that um, all of this happens in real time. So the first process is how do I to dynamic partitioning when the simulation is running and be able to update these partition as we go along. So here is a system uh, where you can see that the particles get moved to different nodes. And here I'm showing a simple system, so it's easier to visualize. Um, so we're running on four nodes and four um, different colors represent uh, particles running their computations on different supercomputing nodes. And we need to aggregate these particles. And you can see that the particles jump around the uh, nodes and also we need to be able to model the interactions between the particles in terms of um, how light interacts with different sets of particles. 
So this is where uh, we are going to put together our PAC Galaxy, which is um, an asynchronous ray tracing engine, which we've been developing at PAC, um, along with the folks in Intel uh, and um, the CPGO MPM code um, for larger deformation modeling. Uh, at the moment, the MPM code can model unstructured grid. Like you see, if you want to model a landslide, then um, you want to model the topography much more easily. Um, so the MPM grid is uh, very unstructured, whereas the galaxy, because it's easier to figure out if a, a light ray goes from the bottom to the top, um, we can figure out where the light ray is going. Whereas if you have an unstructured grid, then we need to map which direction the light ray went, which element did the light ray go into, and what are the other objects behind it, in front of it, and this becomes extremely complex to resolve um, in real time. And we want to be doing this asynchronous and by asynchronous, we mean that the rendering which happens on one end, on a one supercomputing node, should be independent of what happens in other supercomputing node. At the same time, we should be able to manage what's happening at the interface. We've done this a lot in terms of high performance computing and doing simulations, but doing it in terms of ray tracing is extremely difficult, although there are a lot of uh, synergies in both these areas. Uh, so traditionally, if you're rendering a particle, so all the simulations, all the movies you've seen and the rendering techniques that has been used for the several 10, 20 years, um, use an algorithm called Z-buffer. Uh, Z-buffer is basically you have a grid and you figure out what is the depth of every individual object um, so that you can model the light ray reflections and shadows between these different objects. So here you have S1, S2, and S3, uh, three different objects. and um, each object has its own depth field. Uh, so the Z buffer is basically a depth field so that you can put a camera in front and you're trying to see how to render these in sequence. And for example, the S1 object you can see out here, um, or the S2, which is shown in green, it's at the depth of 10 meters uh, or 10 units. Uh, and then you have the red, which is much further ahead. Um, so that has a higher unit and each of them are blocking individual objects. So this is just for three objects and you need to create a Z buffer frame for each of these individual objects. Imagine how many arrays and how big your viewport is going to be. Um, and if you have thousands of particles, that becomes much more difficult. And if you have millions of particles, it becomes virtually intractable. Um, so the approach we've been using is called as instead of using um, Z buffer, uh, we've been developing uh, the approach of asynchronous ray tracing, uh, where we are not modeling what is the depth to individual objects, but looking at the viewport and see if I shoot a light ray through it, how many objects does it bounce off of, um, which means unless I have different boundaries, I will be okay to model most of the system asynchronously on and locally within that individual node. But when I have boundaries, we need to resolve that so it becomes much more realistic. Uh, the tools we are building, the PAC Galaxy tool, which we've been building, uh, is built on top of uh, something called Osprey, which in itself is built on top of Embry, which is the ray tracing engine. And we leverage these Osprey and Embry to be able to do asynchronous communication and ray tracing. Uh, so they give us the ability to model different objects. They give us the ability to do shoot light rays. And we worry about how do we communicate the light rays across so that we can come up with nicer looking simulations. Um, so here you have like gold, um, very shiny metal, uh, plastic material. Stakes of how light reflects off of these surfaces and transparency. It becomes especially difficult when you have glassy material, but luckily soil is not very transparent um, unless you tend to do transparent soil tests. Um, so we don't have to deal with a lot of um, too many light rays bouncing around, but still it's a much more um, comprehensive task for us to deal with. So here is our first rendering of what is actually possible. I'll then show an actual um, video uh, later. So what this simulation is showing is a um, 20 million point uh, uh, rendering. You have eight MPI, which is eight supercomputing nodes running the visualization, while 16 other compute nodes are doing the actual simulation. So all the 16 compute nodes are running simulation, sending the data in real time, and the eight, compute, uh, eight visualization nodes are trying to render the scene. 
and we'll watch a video uh, from a different viewport. Um, and this is rendering the, this is our prototype of an OSO landslide, but you can make it to, to model any landslides using NPM. Also, these are not, this is not the real uh, landslide because we just wanted a more dramatic um, rendering of the scene. So the coloring basically represents how far the particles have moved. Um, and this is a long runout distance as well. It's about 1.6 kilometer uh, long runout at which we are trying to render. Um, I want to show you a little bit of a glitch, which you will notice it's not your Zoom, um, not playing the video live, but if you watched it closely there, it will play and then there's a little bit of lag and then plays again. That was us trying to re-render some scenes and uh, live. So, the benefit of doing this is we can have we have an actor uh, client model um, which allows us to run the simulation, let's say at UT in Austin, Texas, and people in Hong Kong or Berkeley and Australia can connect to that supercomputer, um, set up their own cameras to look at different things. Maybe I'm interested in run out. People in Berkeley might be uh, interested at the headscarf, or someone in Hong Kong might be interested in different uh, areas. Areas, and you can do all of this because we have an actor client model, which allows you to do all this rendering without additional costs um, in terms of compute power, uh, because once you set up your screens and you're doing ray tracing, we'll be able to extract out and have a more interactive playground, which can be accessible, um, not just to the people who are running it, but also others to connect out from the outside. Uh, so this hopefully makes our, this isn't as close to Disney um, snow, but we're um, getting uh, closer as we start to add much more realistic features. So we are not only trying to make particles look nicer, we want to also add features like global illumination. That is something like if you have a sun on the top, how that uh, light will get reflected. We want to have global illumination. So you can see on the left hand side, these are particles rendered without any global illumination. And on the right, we have uh, global illumination, which allows you to see the shadows and depth of each particle. So these are costly operations, but we are still able to do these things in real time. The only down, downside to this is the visualization at this point is running real time, but our simulations are still slow. And that's something we want to be able to tackle. And I'll show you what we do in terms of speeding up our simulations. In terms of the workflow, I kind of described the actor model where you can set up how your rendering should look like. So um, you can set up different materials, how the layout, noise texture, where you want to put your camera and set everything up. So it is very visual in terms of creating these workflow environment. And then once you're set up, you can play around with these uh, rendering. Um, these have a fine, the tag Galaxy tool has a very good API. So if you're using other codes, you have your own DEM or NPM codes, you can easily plug into ours and uh, get the, get the benefit of doing a real time in-situ visualization app for free because that's our goal to make it available, not just to our code, but to any code which is using DEM or NPM. Want to go a little bit, a uh, couple of slides talk about where the future um, of scientific visualization is going and where we could benefit from doing these real time playgrounds um, and why this is a very good uh, a venue for teaching um, is so far all the scientific visualization either on CPU or GPU uses an existing API. Uh, so I talked about Emory Optics and CUDA are um, for GPUs engines and Intel Osprey sits on top. But it, recently there has been a push in the scientific visualization community to have a unified API to do all this rendering. So just because you move from CPU to GPU, you no longer need to switch your API. So you don't want to go from Embry to Optics. Um, instead, you will have something called Anari, which is a new framework and the MPM code, as well as the TAC Galaxy, the first prototypes of testing out the scientific visualization. So we are going to leverage the GPUs for computing, but 
also to do scientific visualization and rendering. So it will be a unified process where simulation and visualization go hand in hand, generating much cooler looking images and not just scientifically accurate red green plots of danger areas in your visualization. So the world is going to go from different APIs. So here you can see CPU, GPU, and there's Vulkan and OpenGL, which kind of uh, goes across CPUs and GPUs to a more unified uh, high level API, which will allow you to do these um, in situ visualization. So we are thinking of our tag galaxy code to be sitting on top of Amari, which will then allow you to do couple it with other codes. So your own, bring your own code and you'll be able to leverage uh, the um, visualization platform we've been building. So the, uh, that's the component one, um, which was the in-situ visualization. Now I want to talk about component two, which is deep learning. And the idea behind this is mainly because I was telling when you're trying to do a millions or billions of particle simulation, your simulation is actually slow. What typically happens is we basically render the scene and we are waiting for the simulation to progress to the next step so we can get an update and look at what is happening. So if you want to build something real time, uh, in a with thousands or sorry, if with millions of particles, then you want to be able to have a very fast simulator. Uh, you can leverage high performance computing or a supercomputer like we were using. We can go up to like hundreds of uh, supercomputing nodes uh, using tens of thousands of uh, cores, or you can even use GPUs, but those simulations are still not real time. Uh, you're still waiting for it to complete a step. Once you like, you can obviously easily do uh, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of particles, but we are talking about millions of particles so that you can your interaction becomes much more realistic and be able to play with this. Um, so we've been working in this area of deep learning. And I'm particularly interested in two areas of deep learning. Uh, deep learning has mainly been a black box model, and I'm trying to open up the black box and explain what deep learning does. And one of the biggest challenges in deep learning is generalizability. Uh, and that's where my main focus of interest. And I want to clarify um, the terminologies which are often used, which is AI, machine learning, and deep learning. Uh, so I'm only talking about deep learning, which is actually a subset of machine learning, which is a subset of AI. Uh, I'm not talking about the Terminator movie and Skynet, uh, which is what we generally think of AI is, um, where it is the general human-like behavior uh, that is beyond the realms of me being a geotechnical engineer and trying to understand the physics of granular material. So our focus has mainly been on using a subset of AI tools, which is uh, mainly based on statistics uh, to enable our um, understanding of granular material. And a subset of that machine learning is the deep learning network, which is basically has multiple layers of neural network, which makes these learning much more uh, feasible. So traditionally, you've seen there's been a lot of work uh, in machine learning. Machine learning is exploding a lot in our uh, geotechnical area and planar matter. And many people have used it to be able to predict the stress strain response for pressure generation. Uh, Typically, what you have is a series of input parameters like the position, the time, the velocity, or your current stress state, and what is the next uh, displacement increment. Uh, a magical neural network happens, and then you get a low dimensional likelihood, which is typically a stress strain response, um, or um, you get a displacement field. These are useful if you're looking for low dimensional data, but if you want to do a simulation type of material, um, modeling, then it becomes much more difficult. Um, and the general limitation of machine learning is what your training data set is. So here I'm showing like two typical training sets, which are using uh, LBM DEM. <clears throat> uh, so Lattice Boltzmann coupled with discrete element. And we are training the machine learning model to understand what the dynamics looks like. And here it is at zero degrees, and this is a five degree slope. Testing it on a 25 degree or a 30 degree slope will not be realistic. In other words, when you train your machine learning models in a smaller subset of data, and you're trying to extrapolate outside of it, machine learning models typically fail. And this is what we call generalizability of machine learning. That is, 
as long as you're interpolating within your data set, you're great. And as soon as you step outside of your data set and you're trying to extrapolate into regions outside uh, of the training, then the results are not trustworthy and sometimes things will explode and not really get uh, correct results. And because of the black box nature, if you don't really have access to the original data set, you don't really know whether that prediction is correct. Um, and the important problem of machine learning is how do you generalize it? And how do you explain what uh, the model actually learned. And those are two important things if you're thinking um, as a physicist and uh, working in a um, granular material world, you want to be able to explain what the granular material did. Um, and without that, um, we lose our hundreds of years of history of learning continuum and discrete theories. So uh, this work um, is um, based off of the work from Google's DeepMind, where they came up with a new type of machine learning model called graph networks. Um, and we have developed on those methods of using graph networks to simulate granular materials. And I'm showing here the reality. My reality is material point method. And obviously, like uh, the reality could be discrete element model, where you train DEM to uh, model individual particles and the interactions, see how that looks like train our graph networks to be able to reproduce a similar looking behavior. Um, as you can see, the graph network doesn't exactly capture it. It's not trained as well. Like I'll show you examples where uh, what happens as you go through different levels of training, uh, but it is able to replicate the whole uh, behavior of granular material in a much more uh, believable way, which allows us to then use this as a playground uh, to do large scale um, uh, large scale in situ playgrounds for teaching DEM or teaching granular material behavior. So, how does this work? And this is based on a technique called graph neural networks, uh, where we are um, leveraging the fact that the physical system, in this case DEM or MPM, is has a spatial distribution and connectivity and interactions. Um, and using that, we are able to understand what is happening at the current time step to be able to predict what will happen in the future time step. Um, so if you want to check out our code that's available on GeoElements Graph Network Simulators, GNS, um, and uh, this is an open source uh, graph network simulator code, um, which the other open source code is from Google's DeepMind, and this uses PyTorch, and it is distributed, so you are, we are actually faster um, than the original implementation. And we also have made uh, advances in terms of graph network, which allows us to explain what a graph network is doing, while also improving um, the physics, which is putting in energy conservation or conservation of momentum to improve our modeling techniques. So uh, most neural networks um, work this way, where if you want to predict a dynamic system, uh, that is, you know the position, current position x at time t, and you know the velocity at time t, the neural network, which is just layers of neurons connected um, very deeply, as in multiple layers of neural network, um, multiple uh, layers of neurons, uh, they will be able to predict what the next time step position will look like. Um, and this is often a difficult problem because you're trying to make the neural network predict what the next step is going to be given its current position and velocity. It might be a very simple uh, explicit integration equation for us, but for a neural network is much harder. So inst and um, although the neural network comes from the idea of how human brains work. Our neurons in our human brains are much more complex so they are able to do much more complicated operations. Most of the neurons in a neural network are very simple and do simplistic uh, polynomial operations um, and some, some smoothing operations that make them do these predictions. Um, so if we want to make a um, neural network behave better, that is able to predict things much better, we want to be able to put in some physics. And and that's what we are calling as inductive biases is basically um, what can we do to help our neural network to learn much more quickly and also be able to predict in a realistic fashion. One thing we can do is give it a static prior, which basically means the current time step uh, is going to be responsible in predicting the future time step. So instead of giving the current time step and the velocity and asking it to predict the next time step, what we are saying is 
the next time step position is pretty much closer to where you are currently. So if you know where you are currently, then you're just doing a correction um, to its position. So if you don't have any velocity, this automatically stays static and the neural network doesn't have to do a uh, huge job of figuring out, oh, when velocity is zero, the position doesn't change. Otherwise, this neural network at the top has having a much more difficult time. You can start to put more physics um, into it by knowing what type of system you're simulating. Most of our system are gravity driven, driven inertial systems, which means we can set inertial priors into our system. So not just in terms of position, we can put in the velocity and do, do an explicit um, velocity times delta t to be able to predict the next uh, time step. So by using this inertial prior, we reduce the amount of um, learning the neural network needs to do. And it is still using the current uh, position and velocity to be able to predict the next position. So why uh, that's the general idea. And we want to now use these uh, idea of inertial prior in a specific framework called graph neural networks. Why do we have to go with this special type of uh, neural network called graph rather than using traditional uh, techniques of neural networks, which is called multilayer perceptrons? Uh, the problem with multilayer perceptrons is if you have like a gravity driven system like these and you want to put in position of every individual particles in here, and that goes into a vector in a multilayer perceptron, which means if I change the order of the position of the particles, uh, the geometry is still the same. I'm just simply changing the order in which I number my particles. Then the multilayer perceptron will not be able to predict what my next position is. Yeah, it will just fail because it doesn't understand what are the invariants in the system and what things don't change. Um, like the local interactions don't change, but um, the position is independent of it. Uh, so you want to have some sort of invariance in your system. So instead of using the traditional multilayer perceptrons, we rely on the graph networks, a particular technique in graph network called message passing, which allows us to do permutation invariant system. That is, it doesn't matter what order my particles are going to be numbered, uh, I will still be able to generate uh, the behavior of the dynamic system. So instead of giving an entire array of positions and velocity, what we do is we recreate the geometric spatial structure. So if you have discrete element particles, each of your nodes in this graph represent the discrete element particles. If it's MPM, they represent the MPM uh, part. And the edges in the graph basically represent the interaction. Typically in DEM, that's your force law, um, which governs the interaction between the two solid particles. And uh, we use neural network locally. We don't use neural network as a global picture, but we use neural network at the local level. That is each individual vertex will use its own neural network to reduce the dimension. And the edges will also use its own neural network to pass information between these particles. By establishing this graph structure and using message passing that allows us to interact with different particles, we make it permutation invariant, which basically means we are um, ignoring the uh, fact of how you number your particles and allow us to do much more um, dynamic systems without having to worry about spatial uh, ordering. So the updates happen this way. So each vertex in a graph um, will have a neural network and each edge in a graph will have a neural network which will convert the position and the force um, that fields into a latent dimension, which is of a lower order. A message passing happens and the graph network gets updated and we will relink um, and figure out where the new edges and positions are. Uh, so we are using the current uh, features of nodes and edges uh, to be able to predict what is going to happen in, in the new edges and new features and be able to predict the next position. In addition to the edge and node features, we also have a global feature or global embedding. Um, global embedding, you can think of like gravity is acting um, vertically in its case or uh, acceleration due to gravity can be enforced uh, fully or um, you can also think of it as body forces in your system which are much more uh, global. So, now we go into the mechanism of how a graph neural network works. Um, so we are particularly looking at the edge interaction. 
most of our systems like DEM uh, does this already. Basically, you have two particles, um, and those two particles are, have a position velocity. They interact. There is a small overlap, and that overlap gets converted to a force. Um, and that force is basically our edge uh, information, which we call message. Um, so what we do is um, we take the edge features, which is typically your force relationships, uh, receiver node features. This might be velocity and position, source node features and any global features uh, and put it into the neural network for individual edge. Uh, so we collect all these information and convert it to a smaller latent dimension. And this is called uh, the edge message function. And we do that for every single edge. So if I have millions of particles and uh, let's say 100 million interactions, then we do this hundreds of millions of times, but each of it is local, which means I can do it really quickly. Then once we have this edge feature updated, uh, we now move on to updating the nodal features, which is basically superposition. So going again back to a DEM example, if you have a uh, spherical particle and you have multiple particles around it, and you're computing the force on each of these interactions, you can basically do a superposition, add up all of those forces, and you will um, be able to get the edge message function. So similarly, we do the same superposition principle, which we've been using for a while. Um, to update all the edge information um, and uh, around a single uh, vertex or so around a single particle and use that to call as the E prime hat. Um, now for the neural network for individual vertex. So this uh, neural network is going to take the aggregated edge features, which is the superposed uh, edge information connecting all the edges to this particle the local nodal features, and if there is any global feature, um, then use that to reduce the feature to a neural network latent dimension, and that gives us a new updated vertex feature. And we then use this updated vertex feature to be able to predict the position of the particle. Um, we can also predict stresses and other properties. So in general, how it works um, is we train it on simulations. So we need simulations. We can also train it on um, real camera images, uh, but you need to have lots of them. Um, so either you can do DEM simulations or MPM simulation, train it on these systems so that you can reproduce what the behavior is when you put it in a different uh, kind of environment. So this is at time t equals zero, and then you keep updating and the machine learning algorithm will be able to predict what's going to happen at time t plus one. Uh, the first step is we construct a graph, then message passing that is interaction happens and we are able to predict the dynamics. Um, so here we will look at um, how what are those individual sections. So how we construct a graph, what message happening, message passing happens, and how are we going to do uh, the predictive dynamics. Uh, so here, um, where we have the encoder, encoder is what takes the positions of our particles and uh, converts it into a graph. So like I said, each of them have its position. Uh, so we can encode those position into these nodes of our graph or the vertices of our graph. And the edges basically represent the interaction. Um, the, here is what another invariance becomes useful because uh, it doesn't matter where these two particles are. As long as two particles are interacting with each other, we are always interested in the relative position between them. Uh, so it doesn't matter whether they are interacting at a location 100 and 101, or it is happening at 10 and 11, the relative position is what controls the behavior. Uh, so instead of storing the position of the particles, we end up storing the relative position on the edge, and that allows us to make our system to be spatially equivariant. Um, then we end up storing the velocity and the type of particle. So you can have multi-body interactions uh, in here and allow us to have a spatially equivariant system, which are then much more easier uh, to do message passing on and learn the dynamics. So we have these features learned, and these features go through the neural networks corresponding to the edges and corresponding to the nodes. Um, and those messages get transferred between the particles. And here is where another DEM principle becomes very useful uh, or 
in general, uh, our physics understanding becomes useful, that is conservation of momentum. Um, and we can enforce conservation of momentum by saying the message which is being encoded between edge i to j should be the same as the message that goes from j to i. Because uh, if you have two particles that overlap, the force between those two particles should be exactly the same. And we can enforce those constraints into our graph neural network, which allows message passing to be much more physically correct in terms of conserving uh, momentum. Final step is to predict the dynamics of what happens in these systems. So we have these individual nodal features and edge features, and um, edge features are aggregated together to update the node feature. Once we have the node feature, you're going to use a neural network to predict what the dynamics is. And what we are using here, like I said, we have an initial prior um, is to predict the velocity. And the next step is the velocity of the current step plus some decoding of the graph, which basically means we are trying to predict the acceleration. Um, in this case, I'm just adding position is position in the previous time step plus the velocity of the next time step um, without a delta t, because we are assuming a delta t to be one. Of course, we can put in delta t um, so that you, you, uh, you can change your uh, DT or uh, time step in your simulation and be able to account for this. And here we are assuming a DT equals one, so that makes our learning much more quicker because it's still a new way to uh, simulate granular materials. So here um, is a granular column collapse. Uh, so this uh, particular simulation is the reality is an MPM simulation and GNS is our graph network prediction. Uh, this is after training the graph network to on soil type of tests uh, after 2 million training steps and using an interaction radius of 0 0.05. By which we mean like whenever we establish the edges, we basically need to have an interaction radius to figure out where these particles will interact with. So as you can see here, that's a pretty good um, Oh, that's the next one. Um, let me see if it plays again. Okay, let's refresh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so as you see here, um, you can see that the reality, which is our MPM simulation, is pretty well captured by the graph network just training after 2 million time steps. And the important thing is the graph network has never seen this uh, column collapse simulation before and is able to uh, replicate pretty well uh, the run out dynamics. So this allows us to be able to um, do build the virtual playground using this because machine learning is something which is going to take a huge amount of time in terms of learning. Uh, so in order to attain this 2 million time step, it takes us about four, um, two days uh, to do on a 100 GPUs, um, whereas the simulation happens in seconds, which means we can do a real-time playground where, with millions of particles and be able to render that all in um, uh, on the go. And training this is not easy. There is various, like this is what uh, you see a show and say that, oh, this is great. But um, if training depends on how many steps. Uh, so if you only train it for 100,000 steps, you can see that uh, this is the prediction from the graph network is nowhere close to what the reality is. It's still trying to learn how granular material is trying to behave. Uh, and it is important to get the interaction radius right um, because here we are using a smaller interaction radius and we figured out like there weren't as many particles around it. So it wasn't able to understand how different particles interacted with each other, uh, which meant when it, it is trying to predict the behavior, it is completely all over the place. Um, so the training is an important step in trying to find the right dynamics, which you're trying to capture and give it enough so that it is able to learn the physics of the system. Um, and it is important to also know about its boundary condition because those are given as relative positions to these particles. And that allows us to say, um, for the graph network, then go ahead, learn about gravity, then go ahead, learn about friction, boundary interaction, and particle-particle interactions. Um, so to 
close off the GNS section uh, between the reality and uh, graph network, showing a uh, rendering, or this is a real time rendering, the reality takes much more longer time to simulate, um, but the graph network is able to replicate the physics almost accurately. Um, so the way we model these uh, artificial ramps in our system is by saying that the positions of these particles will not change. Um, and by constraining these positions of these particles, um, and um, also using some noise in terms of learning so it doesn't uh, learn incorrect uh, movement behaviors, we are able to model a system of ramps which the uh, soil particles have never seen but is still able to accurately capture what the response is happening. Uh, so the next step for us with this graph network simulator is make it more interactive so you can draw um, these ramps and other behaviors and see how the soil flow behavior will potentially change um, as you run through your uh, simulation. So these are machine learning techniques which are very generalizable. So one aspect I've been well, very worried about machine learning is the generalizability. And here we show uh, that these machine learning algorithms can generalize and be able to predict uh, systems which is never seen before. Um, but the other aspect, which is I feel is more important, is less looked at while people start to look at um, applying AI and machine learning in um, geotech or in engineering in general, is can it explain things? And there is a lot of post hoc explanation algorithms which we can use, and I think this is a great tool for teaching because we want to um, uh, let people train their neural network and make predictions. But once it makes the predictions, we ask people to go ahead and see why it made that prediction. Um, so some techniques like SHAP, um, which is an additive way to find the importance metrics of different variables. Typically, your machine learning model is a black box. So here, they're, they're showing an example of a person's age is uh, 65, their sex is female, blood pressure is 180, BMI is 40. Um, the base rate is the average value of your data set, and it predicts an output. And this uh, model is a complete black box, whereas if you use a shape value, you can understand the effect of individual parameters in your system. Uh, that is, what is the effect of age versus gender? So you can see that this, they're more, um, as they get older, they're more likely to have a certain disease, but because they are female, that uh, rate kind of drops down. And uh, similarly, if you're doing convolution neural network or any neural network to understand um, which zones in your features are important, like this is a grad cam technique to figure out whether um, a particular classification, dog versus cat, is working or not, is saying, oh, this is why this phase is why I think this is a cat. That's the AI trying to explain its decision, and it becomes extremely useful and I've been using uh, and developing machine learning techniques which are explainable in our work and I wanted to show you a place where machine learning algorithm actually failed. Um, this is one of the uh, published papers where they were able to generate uh, predictive accuracies on New Zealand's liquefaction data set at an accuracy of 85%. For a machine learning model that is great for a human that is great if you're able to say whether a particular site is going to liquefy or not at 85 percent of the time uh, and that's uh perfect but what we find out when we were trying to explain um is it said whenever there is a high peak ground acceleration so here 0.5 g um then there is almost no chance of liquefaction so the model actually learned a local feature and thought that was important and learned it incorrectly, which basically means that it is predicting whenever you have high PGAs, this model, which is 85% accurate, is going to predict that it, the site will not liquefy only because you have a high PGA. Um, and you can see that um, in the SHAP value, the importance metric, um, that whenever you have high PGAs, it is learning that it is something that leads to no failure. So when we are allowing people to use virtual playgrounds, we want to have these type of metrics uh, that allows people to not just look at what is happening, but reason with it to have a higher level of understanding. Uh, and we can also ask people to derive fundamental equations like the let's get the linear spring system out from a graph neural network and see if that makes sense. So thus, you're not only allowing people to play around and understand the interactions, but also derive fundamental physical laws by using these playgrounds. Um, so the last part, this is a very tiny section, uh, which we've been working on is extended reality. 
personality. We all like uh, to be Tom Cruise in Minority Report. And we want to make this is the last part of our extra playground where we are going to bring in the in-situ visualization tools we've been developing, uh, graph network simulation, and finally the XR platform um, so that we can build um, a real world interactive playground um, which is which allows engineers and um, students to understand what the behavior looks like um, so our platform is built on unity and uh, we are using ray casting but we are also using ray casting using our own visualization tools because we need to be embed those realistic looking simulations um, rendered into our system uh, so far we've been able to identify slopes um, and their angles so we are able to extract the topography our next step which is um, currently we have a couple of students from google summer of code working with us uh, to generate these so that we can do a rendering like this uh, so we can go out. This is a Hyde Park slope in Austin. We will be able to go out, you put on your um, VR goggles and be able to get the topography, run your simulations. When in this case, you will run a graph network simulations and realistically look at what the runout could potentially do. Um, and there's been a lot of um, work around using XR. I saw several presentations, but we want to take XR to a more um, real scaled real world uh, behaviors and not just do a small lab scale uh, system. So thank you very much. And that's uh, everything for me. Thank you, Krishna. It looks like the future of our simulation, how we can use and then how we can interpret it, uh, the uh, data that we see from the simulation. So thank you so much. I just wonder any of my colleagues uh, have any questions. I see Joel uh, on the screen. Joel, do you want to ask a question? Yeah. Hi, Krishna. Thanks for the presentation. That was great. Um, I was wondering for the in situ viz that you were showing with TAC, like what's the file format uh, that you're saving? Is it like just a, a video format or what type of post processing can you do with that um, once you've selected your viewport? Uh, once you select your viewport, you're going to get um, snapshots of images. Uh, so the idea for in-situ visualization is exascale simulation. Once you go like really huge, you get to a point where you cannot write data out. Um, so the idea is to balance, okay, you don't write data out every time step, but you can take lots of pictures. Pictures are not expensive, a um, couple of megabytes. Uh, so you store those, um, but the problem is, um, where would you set your viewport? Uh, that's an, because everything is real time, right? Uh, so you're looking at the also landslide happening and then you figure out, oh, my runout's gone past my viewport. Now, only after it goes past your viewport, you're, you can go and move your viewport and say, okay, 10 steps from now, put the viewport here and look at it. Um, so what we are trying to do right now is because use this graph networks, uh, we can do simulations in real time. Uh, that allows us to, pre-predict what's going to happen uh, and then set up the view codes accordingly. Um, and it's, it's still an active area of research because this is like people have not done exascale simulations and rendering it at exascale, but trying to do it in real time gives us even more additional challenges. Um, so images is what we write out. Uh, there is a open source tool called Cinema. Uh, cinema database, and that's what allows you, uh, gives you like a unified API to do the rendering, which looks more realistic. Great. Yeah, thank you. It, it seems like you said that it would be challenging, like if you're taking pictures of a cross section to know which cross section to be looking at, like if you want to see like where your failure plate is or, right. or run out, like you mentioned. So yeah, that, that would make sense that you can use some of the other tools that you discussed to take a good estimated uh, yeah, yes, we, basically. It's, yeah, it's like uh, predicting where a crime's going to happen and set up your cameras before that happens, um, which is very difficult and do real well because you have no idea. But if you can predict reasonably accurately uh, and say, then go and do once your DEM simulations come to that stage, you know exactly, oh, there's an interesting feature that's going to happen. Let me capture that. But you can also try to predict where interesting features are happening using machine learning. That's something that we have not explored, but we are currently working on this uh, machine learning um, driven viewport assignments um, for a conference. What? Great, I have one more follow-up. Um, I was just wondering like how many viewports have you done at one time? Like, is there a, a maximum 
not at this point we have done like hundreds of viewports and um, the benefit also is because of the way it is set up, it's everything is server-side rendering, um, which means like uh, your Berkeley team can set up 10 viewports and Cambridge team uh, can set up another 20. And we can all look at different things and you will all be seeing real time and you're interacting with the same simulation set. And that's the beauty of it is like, you don't have to run multiple simulations. We can all interact and only hope is you all have good internet speeds uh, to <laughs> render it, uh, but that will catch up. <laughs> Great, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Joel. Uh, any other questions? Um, I think Nanda he, had- Nanda has a question. Yeah, do you want to answer that one, Krishna? I'm curious to know more about the graph neural network with message passing permutation invariance. It seems that the work is pretty, uh, predicting material deformation accurately and fast. How to predict uh, stress evolutions. Uh, so we haven't tried doing stress <laughs> evolutions, um, but I like we can model the stresses because um, it's an additional feature. It goes through a neural network and that gets captured. Um, it's how you would model loads. Um, I think the general framework is there and we will be able to potentially do it. Um, um, dynamics is easier. Uh, stress evolution, I think we can also put some elastic material and then say uh, plasticity is additional thing it needs to learn, give it some inductive bias. So elasticity is probably an easy inductive bias to give uh, and then figure out just the plasticity part, which might in itself be difficult for a neural network to learn, but I think um, it is still um, possible. Uh, I was talking with Professor Serga about this, about um, I think in addition to stress evolution in general, we can try to understand fabric uh, anisotropy and uh, how fabric tensor evolves. So those are the parts which I think graph networks will be able to extract because these are invariants um, and by that allows us to then look at these invariants and extract analytical equations out of it and maybe we'll be able to derive physics laws using graph networks and hopefully that's where we want to be going in terms of the future rather than using it as a black box use it as another researcher um, or an AI PhD student. Yeah Krishna thanks a lot. Yeah, we want to use these tools to really understand the granular behavior. And I think you sort of show the sign of where we're going in the next step. So uh, I hope that the viewers will appreciate that. So not just running DEM, but how we interpret the, the DEM data, uh, which is sometimes difficult, but then I think the, these tools may allow us to do that. So Krishna, thank you very much for your brilliant lecture today. Uh, we'll be, it will be recorded and then distributed. And uh, thanks a lot again. Uh, thank you, Professor Soga, for having me. Uh, it's been great to be part of this TC105 teaching seminar. Thank you for doing this. Yeah, thank you, Krishna. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, I think you're maybe midnight or uh, evening. Uh, thank you very much for joining from all around the world. Uh, and uh, have a good day. <laughs>